All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can have as much of this hour and 15 minutes to talk uh, creatively about how to supervise um, our attorneys who have forensic science cases. Uh, now, unfortunately, I don't have like a good supervisor list, but I have everybody's application, so you may see me flip through that just as I'm connecting a name up. I don't even have my name tag anymore for some reason. But uh, unfortunately, you've had to hear me speak a couple times already. So it's Chris McKee. Um, I was an attorney at the Public Defender Service in D.C. for about nine, almost ten years. Uh, the last several years, I was special counsel devoted solely just to forensic science issues, plus my own sort of caseload of homicide cases. Uh, so sometimes I'd parachute in, help do sort of a special uh, case that had a special issue on it, but yeah, you know, I mostly advised the director and advised people on their cases. So that's one kind of model. And uh, I understand from Tully, who you heard from uh, the last supervisor meeting when you all were together, you know, he's in that position now. And it's my understanding you ended by talking more sort of about the kinds of models that are out there, maybe for how to organize your offices. And so I thought maybe we'd start with that. Um, how many people have an office where you have a designated, let's say, special counsel in charge of forensic science issues? Okay. Brendan, in what office are you at? Okay. And so you have a couple of different people who work in the area, probably headed, and headed up by one person. Yeah, we have uh, about 10 attorneys headed up by school counselor. Okay. Um, all right, I may ask you to just sort of write structure up on the wall in a second. Uh, do, does anybody have within their office a forensic practice group where a couple attorneys or a group of attorneys are tasked with sort of keeping up to date on the science? Are they the ones who go to the training? Are they the sort of resource that people go to in the office? Anybody have that? Yeah. Kind of? Very in informally. Your what? Informally by accident. Informally by accident. Okay. <laughs> Lawrence, where is your office? It's in Springfield, Mass. Okay. And we um, have a, a, what are called senior trial counsel, and and they are not just forensics, uh, but forensics are part of their um, task. Okay. So you get a, a funky case or, or forensic issue, you can get them involved for that. Okay. And is yours a PD system? Or yes. A PD system. Okay. And Ronald, yours? PD system. Or we have a, well, our public defender office. Or 13 and 14 attorneys, uh, but like the only five of us are with felony where most of those have popped up. So. And where is that? Bloomington, Illinois. Bloomington, Illinois. Illinois. Okay. Um, all right. Does anybody have any other kind of structure that's out there um, for dealing with forensic cases or the supervision? Okay. Well, that, what I thought we could do is maybe brainstorm about what it is we think we can do with the resources that we have, um, or what you know whether you can learn from one of these models like Illinois or from Springfield, Mass. Uh, because you know this is quite honestly there's not that many offices that have done it. Um, we're all stretched in resources trying to figure out how best to do it. We have to deal with attrition. People come, we train, we dump a bunch of money into them, they leave, they move off to Boulder, Colorado, where it's gorgeous and live on the foothills, and, you know, they leave PDS after PDS has invested in them for nine years. All right, how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, and so I think you just have to think creatively about how we're supervising these cases, and let's talk about, you know, can we, can we design sitting here together as a group and not, there's not going to be one model that fits <coughs> all, but can we brainstorm about how we might think it's best, you know, an intake system or something like that. So now, unfortunately, my writing on the board is going to be terrible. Would somebody help me um, just sort of write some of these things down or you, you wouldn't mind doing it? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, Brendan, if you would just, we're going to sort of do an Illinois model. Okay. And if you, if you don't mind being a scripter either, yeah. you, you just put it up there. Um, uh, can you diagram, how we yeah, diagram what your structure yeah. is and how it works.
So we have about 500 attorneys in the office. We have a separate dedicated unit of forensic attorneys. Um, and the way it works is um, they have a separate manager, they have a separate manager, and then we have a formalized um, referral system where um, the trial attorney in the courtroom will get a case, we'll get a stack of discovery, they'll get a DNA, fingerprint, any type of issue, and they know where to go get a referral form. The referral form comes over to our, our manager and he or she handles um, uh, supervising these attorneys, assigning them the cases, giving them uh, the support that they need. That manager also is in charge of um, training, is in charge of all our systems like our um, our databases and things like that. That's um, all done in-house by that unit. Can you describe just for a second um, the referral form for me for a second? What does the referral form look like? How easy is it? Is it electronic? Is it actually a paper form? Is it one side, two side? How difficult is it? One side, it, it's um, one page. We do have electronic or it can be faxed or in our office. And it um, has some vital information about the case, the charge, and things like that. Um, one very, very important thing to have on it um, uh, is uh, the nature of the case and the nature of the, the evidence that they want help with, whether it's DNA or others. We struggled for a while about whether to have included on there or to, to just have orally um, kind of a working theory of the case. It's very hard sometimes to come in and consult on a DNA issue if you have no idea what the working theory of the case is, and the sooner you can get that, um, the, the earlier you know what your involvement is. If you get a DNA case where uh, the working theory of the case is consent, you might handle that case a little bit differently than if it's a, a, an assault case where clearly the defense is going to be some other person did it. Um, so we get um, court dates on there, case numbers, so that we can track. Um, and then we also have on there, one other thing that's important is we have a checklist that the trial attorney has to check off to um, inform us about what type of discovery was obtained, what, what type of discovery it is still needed. And that's pretty much the intake form. Um, if people have questions, just chime in, because I have a couple. To get into the uh, box of 10, what are the special requirements for the rule? Yeah, at some point there was a special job description that was um, generated was a big process. Um, normally what we found is that if uh, your more senior attorneys are up here and your more junior attorneys are down at the bottom of this structure, we tend to recruit from the bottom because newer attorneys are, are uh, a little less scared of science, and a little less scared <laughs> of jaded. That's a real issue because because you've dealt with judges smacking these things down, and like, you know, yeah, you're well, just, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, you just jaded. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, youth is good. By the time you get up here, you know that sometimes you're into a rut about how you handle your cases, and it's hard to get out of that. And before you get into that rut, we try and recruit you out of that. Do you recruit based on? Uh, uh, their scientific uh, background, the, the undergrad education, that sort of stuff? A combination of that. Or do you recruit based on trial skills? It's a combination. So, um, for instance, when I started the unit, I had no formal science background, but I had started to challenge drug chemistry and some of the drug courtrooms, and I just kind of had an interest in it. So we looked for people. So some of the new attorneys in our, in our um, courthouse uh, start off in traffic court. And some attorneys will start up in traffic court and will start examining the UI law and, and challenging it, and some won't. You kind of look for the ones who are who are interested in that in, in, in that kind of endeavor. Are those those five hundred attorneys broken up into different like divisions? Some yeah, they're all over the county. Some, some are felony. misdemeanor, some are felony. Okay, um, but that's trial division. That's yeah. trial division. Okay. Yeah, it's just Cook County is just huge. Oh, I know. I just, yeah. I just like, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's so, the difference in Illinois, too, because in his, uh, what, you have what the, the lateral system where somebody does arraignments, hands it off to pre trial, somebody else in pre trial. Most of our locations, you do have that. Um, there's a few that have gone vertical now, but the bulk of our work at our main courthouse is, is a lateral system where you, uh, you'll meet your client uh, after arraignment. First time somebody else has handled the client up until arraignment. And, and practically speaking, you don't start this referral paper process before that lawyer gets it in the lateral. Right. So that's yeah. already. It's already. It could be a month or two in. Now, um, 
which might seem a little bit late, but usually in cases that have a lot of forensic evidence, those are cases that, that take more time and are slower. So we find that um, a month or two in, the prosecutor is still standing in front of the judge saying, we're waiting on DNA evidence, uh, we're still waiting on testing. So even though we get in a little bit down the road, it's usually not too late to get in and do what we need to do because they're still getting their act together, uh, waiting to get in the queue to get their DNA testing done. Right. Or do your lawyers need that discovery before to fill out the referral form that you've created? That takes a process, and that may take a month or two to, to develop. So there might be you know lessons for here on how to do it, even though our offices might not be structured in this huge uh, behemoth. That and and our, our attorneys in the courtroom now know enough to get the discovery process started as, as soon as possible. They might have to wait for us to get in. They know what subpoenas to start filing, filing to get what information. Do you train the incoming lawyers on how to issue spot for for these issues and sort of flag it early? Absolutely. In fact, one of the big issues that we deal with now that we've become very popular in our office is how to issue spot and get in and out of the case because you can spend a lot of time on a case that really you, you should get in and out of. So issue spotting is a, a very big component of what we do. Okay, let explain that. Uh, who owns the case? Um, Who's in charge? Who makes the decision? 90% of our cases, um, they're in charge and we're consulting with them. Our consultation might be all um, behind the scenes um, and depending on the issues, we might be sitting at a council table lit litigating. It all depends on the case, um, but uh, they make the decisions with their input. Every now and again, there's conflict between what we think needs to happen and the trial attorney um, thinks he, has, he or she has time for or wants to do. And that's when the manager deals with that. And it does come up from time to time that there's a conflict there. Is there some type of a moral commitment that you have your specialized attorneys to make so you don't run into the problems of getting them trained and then after they get all the training and everything, they leave your office? So is there type of some type of a moral commitment? No, no it's, it's, it's just making them feel bad if they, if they take all their training. But what the three years is, is, that, is that most lawyers who get into that find that it's a really, really um, satisfying way to litigate cases because you end up being prepared to, to try issues that you know your opponent isn't ready to, to try, that you know you have a, a, a higher skill level than they do at those issues. And Once you start um, litigating cases that way, you don't really want to jump back into the mix of having so many cases that you can't focus on these and litigate. People who, who get in that unit stay there usually. Now, I know you said you try to recruit the younger attorneys, when you say the younger attorneys, but I mean, is there a minimum of uh, years of experience? Because I think what our problem in our office is, is that we lose our younger attorneys. They want to get out and get their feet wet. So that's what I was wondering on that. Um, uh, we recruit from the, from the younger attorneys. People have been in our office for a year or two, and they seem to uh, like the unit, want to stay there. Um, I mean, let's face it, one of the big drawbacks of being a public defender is your, your massive caseload and sometimes being tethered to, a, to one court and, and going through all the mess that you have to go there that's not trying cases. And if you're in this specialized unit, you know, sometimes your caseloads are smaller and you've got more time to delve into things. To, and, and, and a lot of attorneys find that to be um, compelling. Okay, yeah. so we're in competition for one of those 10 jobs, right? Right. What, what do you look at to decide between a uh, lawyer with relatively same experience? Um, we'll look to see if you've litigated any issues that have shown any interest. So if you've been in the office two or three years, which, which are still young attorneys in our office, and you've been in, through traffic and maybe through our, our juvenile support system a little bit, have you um, taken on uh, a DUI breathalyzer case, or do you stick to that all the time? Have you shown up to um, the some of the um, in-house training that's voluntary that we give on certain topics and show an interest in it. Um, it's usually pretty easy to tell who's really interested in that. Um, oftentimes you can tell during the application, let's say that there's an opening in that specialized unit. You can often tell who the person is who wants to transfer into that unit because they just feel that they need a break and they're burned out. <laughs> versus somebody who uh, who really has an interest and has been showing an interest. It's usually pretty easy to tell that. You know, we, we, we have some more senior attorneys sometimes who, who probably just want to break from the courtroom, frankly. They 
want a change and they're burnt out, and so they think transfer this unit will, will you know, give them a little bit of a break, and um, you know, those aren't the, the people we're looking for. Elizabeth. Do they keep um, a smaller caseload, the 10? Do they have a caseload? In they have no caseload independent. Okay. They don't have much caseload, if any, independent of their consultation okay. caseload. But in, in, in our uh, office, their consultation caseload includes a lot of stuff that they're going to try on. So they will be, they will do the cross of the expert yep. or something. It's Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And we say they'll do it, they may write it out for the lawyer. Because ninety percent of the cases are still held by the lawyer, that might be their role. Is they may uh, not physically go to court. Oh, they we frequently go to court. We'll do the cross. And we'll be the second or third chair on the, on the trial team, depending on how much work there is to do. And you'll be if there are significant issues to litigate, you'll be the one there doing the cross examination. Absolutely. Did you say the manager of that unit also does your system wide training? Yeah. And they think you're out of it. Do the 10 attorneys specialize? I mean, take something that's fairly new that we've encountered, on the cell phone tower and triangulation stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, is everybody is everybody a generalist of your 10? Or, or um, everybody's trained as a generalist, but there is de facto kind of specialists in certain areas, and they'll get those cases. There's some people who, you know, aside from taking cases and consulting, one of the things that those ten, uh, one of the other tasks of those ten attorneys is building up our knowledge base on certain forensic issues. So one person might be tasked to building up a knowledge base on gunshot residue. Um, they'll get more of the gunshot residue cases. They won't get those exclusively. They won't be the only one to get those. But if there's a case that turns on gunshot residue, they're likely to get that. Um, and you have a pathology person. Yeah. So, so that's why he's trained on everything. Right. So ten might be a good number. Of people to have because you can both train for general, you know, for general knowledge, but then also send them off to the IAI conference to focus on pattern matching, or you can send them off to Promega to do DNA, yeah. and they become like a little step ahead. But you know, because of numbers wise, it might work that ten helps you do that. Jerry, you had a question. Does your prosecutors also have a similar group of people that are just doing forensic stuff? They they don't really. Um, they're all kind of generalists. Um, I don't think they need it as much as we do because they have the state forensic lab, which is basically their own experts in their pocket ready to go. And, and frankly, we've all seen them put on a direct and it's not very hard. You know, a, a brand new attorney can read their script. Um, so um, they, don't, they don't have a specialized unit per se. They have this post-conviction unit that does all the post-conviction cases and they get a little bit of expertise in that. They don't have a specialized litigation. Well, we fight that battle locally with trying to want to go to the council about things and say, well, the prosecutor's office has this many people and they have a domestic violence prosecutor and that's all she does. And they have a, a drug prosecutor, that's all he does. And so he's, his trials are all, you know, and public defenders don't have that. Right. So. And they have to forget a lot. Yeah. You know, they all of their, yeah, they have all of those resources, and we have nothing, you know, yeah, when you're going to the council. You total up the lab's budget, and, and just throw that on top of the prosecutor's budget, and that's how much resource they have. Right. Um, all right, anybody else have any other questions? That This model is very helpful to sort of get us thinking and rolling about how uh, this might work with your office, but I want to go through maybe two other models that are out there. So Lawrence, would you mind just coming up, would you mind writing down the votes? <laughs> just sort of what the structure is at yours, and then Ronald, I'll have you maybe do one as well. Can I ask one quick question for that? Yeah. Do you have a turning this on down? When you um, get the request, are there, is there a mechanism for We are struggling with the mechanism to turn cases down. Um, we're struggling with the mechanism to turn cases down and to decide how once we identify a case that's not worth pursuing anymore, how to get in and out of it quickly. Yeah, those, are, those are two problems. What are your criteria? Um, right now, we take all cases that are that are that come in, and then we have to <laughs> triage them and look through discovery and decide in consultation with the trial attorney whether there's some some meat to it that we need to, we need to follow up on. It's pretty informal. Have you been accused of cherry picking? Um, yeah. Probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> How do you deal with that? Um, um, 
<laughs> I'm sure the accusations have been uh, mostly behind our backs. It's hard to deal with. Well, that's usually how law offices work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you approve independent experts? Who makes that call? Yeah, we um, will. We will identify the expert, and they'll be approved by our manager. So there's one person there divvying out the money on expert yeah. money. That's where you get the cherry picking. And that's where you get like the accusations. So it does have to sort of be with one person to take that heat. But so that's that's an important question. Do the five hundred have to refer something to the There are guidelines for certain types of places that they must refer to. Um, so uh, there is a protocol in the office that they get and there is a type of case where uh, there's DNA evidence and sexual assault case they have to refer to. Could you uh, Publish those to this group. Sure, that would be very helpful. That the guidelines, the protocol, the protocols. So probably do that through forms. Some of the facilitators. Yeah, you can give it to me. I'll give it to sure. Georgia. I mean, we love Get forms. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we may even out of this little group here, we can make a you know a discussion group about this if you want. We'll try to see whether we can construct something like that. It might be helpful. I'd be interested to see if, if people are interested in sort of how they're going to be structuring this. We can kind of monitor a little bit. About it, I think that'd be worthwhile. Um, yeah. Okay. I would like to make sure I understand something. So it's built into your budget uh, reimbursement for experts. You don't have to go to an outside agency. That's right. That That's right. Our our funding to hire experts is part of our budget. Okay. A pot of money set aside. Yeah. Here, yeah. We don't have to go to the floor to somewhere else in the region. We have a pot and we spend it through the year. Okay. 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 Right. Thank you. Uh, we have about 200, a little over 200 uh, attorneys in the agency um, that are full-time public defenders. Trial? Uh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, trial and appeals. Okay. And uh, I think there's four or five what are called senior trial counsel, and they're not just forensic. They do, like like I said, any kind of funky issue. Um, I uh, want to. I work in the district court office, which is a misdemeanor concurrent felony office, and uh, I was on vacation this week, um, a judge had what we call the dangerousness hearing, uh, where the, it's a pretrial hearing with the federal system uh, to be held for 90 days, and it was a really lame case, and uh, it was a three-day hearing, and um, the, the judge at the end of it said, well, I don't, there's not enough evidence here. Uh, all I heard was hearsay evidence, I didn't, I didn't hear the two main witnesses, so I'm not going to make a ruling. I'm going to continue the case. And uh, next Tuesday, Commonwealth, I want you to go out and get those two witnesses because I want to hear what those witnesses say. Weird. I mean, what, what do you do? What's the case law? You call um, senior trial counsel. <laughs> uh, but it's senior trial counsel are also, they're also people with a lot of training uh, in forensics as well. So. So on appellate issues, just see, just yeah. seasoned folks that have just been around the block, seen it all, that's who you go to. Yes. Do they get to go to special trainings for forensics? Is that been sort of priority? Um, I, I, you know, uh, I wouldn't say specifically, no. But you know, they generally are the people who do, when they do, when there are you know, special forensic trainings, so they're the people who will go out of their way to get there. And who do they all report to at the top of your uh, arrows? Uh, just the head of PD? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if people chime in with questions, if they have the so organization. Is that just age or experience? Or, I mean, what, what's the criteria for those four or five senior trial leaders? It's, it's age, experience, um, and uh, uh, people who generally done, like, everything. They've done uh, appeals. They've done murder cases. Uh, they've done serious uh, superior court felonies. Where do you fall on this chain? Uh, I am down here. <laughs> <laughs> As supervisor? Yes. So who do you supervise and how do you interact with the four to five? Well, I supervise the, uh, in Massachusetts, it's superior court, which are the heavy duty felonies, and district court, which are the misdemeanors, concurrent felonies. And I supervise the new attorneys who are getting misdemeanor and district court felonies. Uh, but like like I said, we funky issues arise in, in district court as well. I'll just give a call out. Do those four or five attorneys have cases as well? They have their own caseload. Yes. Yeah. And they're you know usually uh, uh, serious cases like murders. And whatnot. But pretty reduced. Uh, yes. They have time to consult if ever called upon. Yes. And do they mentor other lawyers? Or are they? Yes. I mean, 
far as those cases, will they have other lawyers that are like from your division or other divisions come sit on cases with them? Yes. Yeah. And they're always there for basically for like like I said for advice on anything. But they don't have supervisees that are just assigned to them or anything, so that they're free to. That's why you're over there. There's supervisors at different levels within the 200. Yeah. I have a couple questions about both models. In each model, do you guys have training attorneys in each of the divisions who also train the attorneys on these issues aside from these forensic people? Knock on wood, yes. We have a really, really awesome uh, training department, uh, and it's headed by this woman, Kathy Bennett. And a cafe, yeah. 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 <laughs> and what about you guys? Cook we have a, a separate training department that does general training, right. and then all the forensic training we do for all the attorneys is done in conjunction with that training department. Are you? Your system is statewide. Yes. Okay. So you're stationed in Springfield. Are these four or five attorneys for the? For your Springfield division or the entire state? Spread out fairly evenly throughout the entire state. Do they then have to travel from yes. coast to coast? Well, not from coast to coast, but <laughs> there's no specific regional thing, but it just kind of worked out that way. Um, so that's an official title. They're yes. senior trial. I mean, it's not just everybody knows this is who you go to. I mean, that's their position. Yeah. yeah. In terms of discovery, what kind of discovery do you get? about the forensics personally. It, it varies from case to case. Well, I, I, maybe I don't understand the question. Well, there's a rumor going around that Massachusetts, uh, at the commencement of the case, you get a stack of discovery that, uh, that includes virtually everything that there might possibly be. That is a complete rumor. <laughs> <laughs> That's this one kind of thought. Yeah, yeah. Unsubstantiated rumor. <laughs> but it came from a very reliable source. A confidential reliable Any other questions on structure? Or? Uh, I think it is important to point out that there's a different training branch that is is uh, in these offices doing training. That's sort of an interesting uh, development. Um, that somebody is globally looking at the kinds of issues people should be trained on. Is that how, and I know some folks who are here in this room are trainers or the training uh, person like Kathy Bennett in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, how do you all do it if you're a trainer to focus on these forensic issues? Do you have somebody else to go to that you can ask for help? I'm a, training, I'm a director of training and professionalism for the Miami Dade County Public Defender's Office. We have about 190 attorneys. We have training attorneys, the juvenile, county, and felony division. Part of their job is to train on forensics, and part of my job is to actually get other people to come in and do forensic training. So we do office-wide trainings, plus the training attorneys do trainings. Plus, we're very fortunate we have a lot of young attorneys who are really interested in forensics who've taken the bull by the horns, and they're leading the office. They're leading the way. It's, it's like Brendan was saying, they, they are leading the way in forensics, not the older attorneys. Right. Yeah, and it, you know, it's curious, is it, is it the development of sort of the entertainment media attention mm -hmm. to the issue, that they're sort of ears to the ground more on that, mm -hmm. or they were raised on it, or, you know, my sort of raised on Quincy. You know, the bigger, you know what the bigger thing has been? The Innocence Projects. All of these, a lot of the students are working for the Innocence Project in law schools, and as a result of that, they're fascinated by it, and they're now interested in that area where a lot of the older attorneys, there was no Innocence Project. We weren't involved in those kinds of things. So that's been a, a very big deal. So my question, both to you, I guess, Robert and Lawrence, is when you, how do you, how do you uh, go about identifying, number one, what training needs to be done? As a supervisor, I guess, Lawrence, is more a question for you at this point. Like, do you, do you communicate with... Uh, Kat, do you communicate with somebody specific in her office and say, hey, this this lawyer needs this or that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, it seems every year we get a new batch of people in. Um, and by five or six months in, it's fairly obvious, you know, they'll come up to you and say, I'm having trouble with probation violations. Uh, and then it, all you have to do is call Kathy and suggest it. And it, but do you do an evaluation on their, I mean, do you have to go observe them and do an evaluation on their performance and then say, hey, here's what training you need? 
Do you guys have that kind Somewhat. of Somewhat. Somewhat. How about you, Robert? I mean, how's that work? Well, you just brought up a great point. You, you got me thinking that we do orientation for all our new hires in the office. We don't do forensics in the orientation, but you've got me thinking that maybe it's something we should start with right from the beginning as part of the new hire orientation, start dealing with forensics right up front because people go to the juvenile and county court division and they do, at DUI they do a lot of trainings, but in juvenile you've got DNA and fingerprint issues happening all the time. Yeah. In fact, yeah, since you have in the juvenile, you really have the whole spectrum yeah. of mm -hmm. serious felonies. You may have it, you may have it all. And DUIs actually bring up a ton of scientific yeah. issues. Um, and you know, at PDS and the trainings, we would have a day where we'd come and do the people from for the forensic practice group uh, or the special counsel mm -hmm. that I was, would come and do a training maybe half a day or a full day on issue spotting, forensics, mm -hmm. how important it's going to be to their practice. Yeah. Really, you know, uh, capitalize a lot on the energy that they're bringing already to the issue because uh, that already is something that they're starting to think about uh, and it does get them kind of excited. Yes, sorry. Um, I was listening to your um, comment because your system sounds unfamiliar to me. So if you have a batch of new lawyers who come in all at the same time, and somebody comes to you and says I'm having trouble with a particular issue, you said you just picked up the phone and called your state training director? Well, so, yeah, it's not that specific. It, it, well, because what my question yeah, was, yeah. do you provide individualized training or do you do? Okay. No, no, no it, it would be more of a trend. Oh. If, you know, if people... <laughs> I, if I kept hearing, you know, I, I'm really worried about this issue, this issue, then I would say, hey, you know, because we do have annual training conferences, there's a way that you can communicate to Kathy, this is this is a recurring issue. Yeah, they're not interested to us. Ron, could you come up and just quickly give us your structure? Okay. Thank you. So, Robert, how does it work with you while he's walking up here? How does it work with you? Do you have lawyers who are supervisors who say to you, here's what training this person needs? Or yes. Here's general, okay. We have training attorneys for someone who's comes to the felony division after being in the juvenile and county court division. We have three training attorneys. They're assigned the attorneys who have usually experienced about two years, maybe a little bit longer. Whatever needs they have, the training attorney has to deal with it. They bring it to my attention. And then we have training. We have trainings every Thursday for all the new attorneys in the felony division. And we staff cases with them. County and Juvie, they do the same thing. So we're always aware of what the needs are of the attorneys because of the training attorneys. When you have someone working one-on-one -on -one with people, you, you can be you're aware of what the needs are. Plus, we have a senior staff. We have senior supervising attorneys who are supervisors over three divisions, and they also have to be aware of what the needs are for all the attorneys as well. Do you have a lot of, do you have a lot of court supervision? I mean, yeah. not supervision. Uh, do you have people that go in and watch people yes. perform in court? Yes, a lot. And then give, and then what kind of feed, do you have feedback for yes. us, or how do you go about? They try cases with them. The training attorneys are required to try cases with the other attorneys, and or watch the trial and then give feedback. They get a lot of feedback in our office. Yeah. And like, say someone will give feedback, like uh, you know, you need you need to uh, have a better theory in your cross, and mm -hmm. you need to use more chapters mm -hmm. or something like that. Then. Would after you give them that verbal feedback, then would that training attorney actually do a mock cross with them, or would you send them to? Or would, do you guys would you they guys would, do small group trainings? We on do. Cross? We actually do skill trainings. We throughout the year we'll do skill trainings, cross examination, jury selection for people who need those trainings. Constantly doing interactive trainings in the office. Plus the attorney, if they meet with them and give them an evaluation, the next they'll see the attorney do a cross examination, so they'll get to see more experienced attorney actually do the cross. We also, they get evaluated. We have an evaluation of their work and to get off the training list, they have to be able to accomplish certain things on their own. Okay, all right, sorry. Bloomington, Illinois. Yes, Bloomington, Illinois, McLean County. Uh, we're probably considered a medium because they got the, uh, the most in uh, Illinois. 500 attorneys, I think what Lake County has some uh, we're downstate medium. There's some dump, but uh, there's the chief public defender, there's the first assistant, which is me. Uh, then we have uh, three more attorneys, uh, and this pretty much comprises our felony division, uh, juvenile division, uh, three attorneys, uh, 
between abuse and neglect and uh, delinquency, uh, five attorneys in misdemeanor DUI traffic. And uh, so as far as uh, you know, scientific or forensic issues, they had down here the DUI blows, the breathalyzers, the scrapings out of the stuff to see if it's a crack pipe or uh, something like that. You know, it, you know, not a lot really going on here. Juvenile, not much, uh, except for occasionally the abuse and neglect. We just had a big uh, uh, alleged shaken baby situation. So that got very deep, very quick. And all that, but it doesn't happen that often. So those, uh, you know, these folks aren't really into the, the forensics so much. Uh, for the rest of us, uh, all, all of this, uh, as far as forensics, uh, you know, they, they they come to me. Why? Because Ron went to one of those forensic seminars. Uh, that's really uh, pretty much it. I, I mean, I've done some other forensic training. Uh, most of us in, in this area at one time, because of uh, uh, the rules that we did have in Illinois, we had to, uh, uh, we wanted the felony division uh, certified either as lead or co counsel for capital litigation purposes. Uh, so just by recent uh, rules of the court we had to have uh, what was it, 12 hours every two years and a lot of that we soaked up a lot of forensic information some more than others but that's uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much it uh, the rest uh, uh, we in Illinois we've been what uh, five years with uh, mandatory uh, CLE uh, the other states have had it for much longer than we have uh, but in the uh, other than that, uh, we pick it up through the Office of State Public Defender, the Public Defenders Association, the State Motor Association. You can pick up a thing here or there. Uh, uh, you know, they might you know have uh, you know some DUI folk or you know some DNA people stop in uh, through some ISBA things. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, that, that's pretty much our structure. Anybody specialize in certain areas, like become the sort of go-to person on DNA or the go-to person on gunshot residues? Uh, no, that's mostly de facto because we don't have those cases uh, all the time. Like us, like uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, these guys in the Cook. Do they, you know, each one of those guys probably has more murder cases on their on their current docket than any of us is going to have in their career. Uh, so it's an as need. You know, we can't send. It doesn't make sense financially to send all these people to every DNA conference uh, around. So it's kind of like uh, how it happens. Who had the last one? Who had the you know? They around you used a DNA guy. Uh, you know, what can you tell me? Uh, it's very informal uh, for me, and I try to use these networks and, and pull that. It's, and as far as uh, official training and, and why I'm here too is that I'm hopefully the State CLE folks will uh, allow me to be a trainer so I can do the in house training here. Uh, and we borrow off each other from some of these networks. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, Lake County, uh, Keith in Lake County, some other, Bill Wolf helps us out once in a while. Uh, we kind of borrow off each other throughout the, throughout the state. Um, there's a, a CLE funding crunch or something that they, not everybody. You know, all the offices got their funding cut, so they can't send people to these seminars. Uh, they, you know, make do and try to start doing some things in the house. Do you ever bring the Cook County folks down ever? To uh, yeah, or we go up there. Uh, they, they got some very fine seminars. Uh, one I did years ago. Do they still do the one with the EMEs? They bring the, the EMEs. We get, you know, get yeah. to cross examine the, the EMEs. They get practice testifying. We get practice cross examining. Uh, that, I think we that come downstairs for uh, with Ickle to do some forensic training. That's right. Ickle. With Ickle? That's the Illinois Continuing Legal Education sure. Company. Yeah, and um, and uh, I haven't heard, maybe you have, on since uh, you know, there was a ready-made program when the death penalty was active, but I don't think anybody's heard yet what they're going to do with the certification list and, and what we do. So. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm looking here, because some of the stuff we were used to and just kind of getting it by accident, even that's not going to be there. Right. Um, questions? Any other questions? It, uh, is your public defender's office in Illinois set up on county by county or statewide? County by county, uh, which, uh, yeah, is, 
it's an interesting thing. Uh, they got a whole different structure in Cook County with 500 people. Uh, like I said, we're 13. There's some counties that are just pretty much cornfield and a courthouse. Uh, a couple of grain elevators. So you may have uh, one person who is public defender for two different for two counties. Uh, it, it's the wide spectrum. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Uh, anybody else with a structure uh, of how they deal with forensic cases that might be helpful to the group? Um, all right. Well, I'm going to talk about PDS's structure a tiny bit uh, and see if we can uh, learn anything from that model as well. Uh, I actually sort of, it's nice, we have sort of large, medium, and small. Uh, PDS, you know, we, we may be small in size, the District of Columbia, but we were large in budget uh, because uh, DC's appropriation bill coming from Congress always has generated a good revenue stream. So that's why. PDS was structured a little bit more like Illinois here, where we had a designated special counsel in charge of forensic issues. And then, rather than have like 10 people designated just for forensics, we did it in a structure of it was a voluntary group uh, of lawyers. And so, it was a sort of a prestige thing, you know, you'd put your name in to apply for it. Uh, and that's just to be a member of the forensic practice group, that every two weeks would meet together, um, and discuss issues. They'd be then identified as the people in the office to go to to talk to. It's also how we were then able to sort of divvy out who could go to, to training uh, on particular issues. They would be drawing from, you know, in tight or lean years of budgets, we'd just draw from the people who said that they had a special commitment to forensic issues. And so then we try to uh, make that person a little bit of the point person on that particular issue if we're going to send them to that conference. So it was sort of a voluntary group that had their own caseload and they were still reporting to whoever their supervisors were and they had their own issues. Um, but then they also, every once in a while, were put on as junior co-counsel with, with a serious case that may have had a forensic issue because they've been getting the training and since they had expressed an interest you know, we sort of, uh, you know, assign them to go to, uh, to work with a senior lawyer. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether it's self-selective um, or it was the screening process of who applied to be in it, but, you know, you didn't turn that many people down who, who showed an interest. But they were the people who tended to stay the longest. Uh, for whatever reason, they were very interested in the work, maybe. Or they were very interested in, in what was cutting edge in the work, because that's really what sort of the forensic issues are. Uh, they are the more cutting edge issues. So these are people who are committed uh, to want to, to be involved in, you know, what's going on at the courthouse and, and doing a good job at it. So that's kind of how we did it. So you didn't have to, you know, take 10 people out of uh, the trial division uh, and give them just forensic cases. And you, you actually, you know, just uh, went to them occasionally or gave them a special training. So I think, you know, many of the sort of smaller offices, that probably makes sense. Uh, if you're not a big office, it probably makes sense to maybe, you know, deputize uh, some of these lawyers who show an interest. Um, and then I do think it's a good idea maybe how PDS had structure where the expert approvals come from that one special counsel person who knows what's going on with people's cases. Uh, you know, you're going to approve expert funds. Uh, you know, which I was pretty stingy about, I would make sure that maybe I want a junior lawyer from FPG to get on the case so that I know that they're uh, marshalling resources correctly. Uh, and this is actually, I was going to ask you, Brendan, from your model here, you said, like, you all will help identify the expert. What was the cost savings that you think that was able to do for your office because you were able to in-house do a lot and you also didn't waste time picking experts that were inappropriate or said that they needed to look at everything in a case file and run up 30 hours or 40 hours before they ever really do anything of interest to your case. Can you, can you sort of address that issue? Yeah, well, this unit started with about four attorneys in 2001, 2002. And the reason, it, one of the reasons it grew was because we found out we were saving money because um, as your expertise in the area grew, you didn't have to send every case out for uh, review to an expert. There were a lot of, it, a lot of them that we could, um, could sidetrack and 
it's, we knew that they didn't did not need uh, a five or six or eight thousand dollar extra down. And we were also able to, to save money because if you've got a few people who have a, a lot of interaction with the experts, they're going to know faster because of the knowledge base is more concentrated who you get good value from. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than spending a lot of money on experts and not really getting anything from them. We've all had that happen. I mean, we, uh, Robert and I, I think we were talking about this earlier, we played finger connections. You can spend $5,000 here and, 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 you, and you get nothing out of them. But if you get some people who are trained who can triage out cases that don't need experts and then who can identify the experts who give you value, you save money very quickly. To throw into that the fact that our office was sued in the mid-90s for um, ineffective assistance when the lawyer uh, missed a, uh, a DNA call. And it starts to save your office money to get up to speed on this and, 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 and to get people highly trained. You know, in, with regard to like growing your in-house expertise, um, you know, I saw it all the time at PDS because we would write the affidavits for the expert or we would call the expert and say, this is the issue. I've triaged this case. Uh, you know, I think this is a calculation on the combined probability inclusion that I think is wrong. And they're applying the formula incorrectly, or, you know, they're claiming too much dropout. Let's cut all your having to analyze everything. We've done it ourselves. This is what we need you to do. I would write an affidavit and say, this is, can you say this? Can you, you know, would you be able to say this? And we cut all of it out. So from a cost savings part, what we were get, getting out of the group was so much better than what we were spending if we didn't have some sort of organized way of dealing with this. And I'd say the same would go for a small office. And small offices have even more of a problem because the expert pool is not that deep, or they've got to go to the judge uh, and ask for the money. And then, you know, the judge is thinking, I don't want this to be open-ended. I would need to know it's contained within a certain amount. And I addressed this this morning. That's where you've got to do the homework. You know, if you've done your homework on the expert, what the expert's going to be able to deliver for you, and what you need from the expert, you should then be able to ballpark what the cost is going to be of it and let the court know that. And it's going to be, you're going to have much more credibility with the court to say, I've done all these things. I've looked up all these things. I've read the books on it. I found out that this is the appropriate expert, not the, you know, you know I've not got a generalist. I've got a specialist in this particular area because that's our, our real issue here. Um, so, you know, in the end, I think you could save a lot of money by, by investing in this, uh, this sort of idea. Uh, any other sort of... I have a question about your group, the uh -huh. PDS group. You said there's a spent special counsel. Mm -hmm. Is that an attorney, an experienced attorney who handles cases as well, who has a caseload? Yes. So it's somebody, it's generally been somebody who's sort of come up through the ranks at, at the Public Defender Service. You know, maybe practicing for 10 years mm -hmm. or so, uh, and has gone through all these sort of special trainings, has, has you know, an not only an interest, but some, some sort of aptitude for the scientific issues. Um, you apply for it, and then you get selected for it. Uh, what else was it about how? No, and they're in, char they're in charge of the voluntary group. They're in charge of the voluntary, voluntary group. group. They're in charge then of all ex uh, expert expenditures. They're in charge of training in the particular area of forensic science. Um, you know, you even interact with, with the, the training, training director, director right. who trained the new lawyers coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the training director is also charged with doing CLEs for mm -hmm. private lawyers mm -hmm. that were on the CJA panel during the summer sessions. And if uh, the training director knew there was a forensic uh, issue, maybe they would go to the special counsel to ask it. But the special counsel that also was in charge of running a two-day forensic science conference each year for the CGA panel and the PDS lawyers to come mm -hmm. to as well. And so we would have about 150 people attend a forensic science conference each year. This year it was on DNA cross-examination 101. The year before it was on mental health issues, everything from psychiatrists to psychologists to brain, uh, you know, uh, brain injuries to PTSD as defense for veteran cases. You know, very focused on those issues. Uh, while I was there, I did one on, on guns, and it had everything to do with guns, which, uh, which was DNA on guns, fingerprints on guns, gunshot residue, uh, then the bullet striation tool mark, and it was you know, all packaged within a nice two-day, you know, exposed them all to those issues. 
but it drew upon those who had forensic science to sort of focus on that. Uh, so that's, that's how that was structured. In hiring experts, then uh, it would be the, the, in your organization, be the group of 10, the box. They decide. Yeah, they put in the request for funding up through the manager. manager. Yeah. And the manager decides, or the, the so manager decides? Yeah, okay. How did they decide that in your organization? Yeah, the special counsel made the decision. Made, the special counsel made the decision. You know, yeah. so the same thing as like a manager. Right, same as the manager. What's and the then I would inter I, I'd interact with the expert myself at some point and say, hey, we can't pay that. We only pay two hundred dollars an hour is the top we could ever possibly do. Will you work with us on it? I will approve up to this amount of hours. Um, and so, you know, but the buck stopped with me. So you would take an active role in doing. Some of that with the with the free negotiations because my line attorneys, you know, they're interested with their case. They want to, you know, they they come to me. They've asked for money. They don't want to be squabbling over money with the expert, and so I was willing to take that on uh, and help them out in that area. Uh, but also, I was in charge of actually identifying experts, building up our expert base. So I, you know, I would approach experts out in the field and try to negotiate a price and have it already set, so the lawyers wouldn't have to worry about. It. Yeah, kind of dickering over that kind of stuff. Okay, then in terms of managing that sort of money, uh, uh, I remember when I was doing death penalty cases, I was more of the, well, yeah, I just needed, you know, give me the money type thing, right? And in death cases, they usually produce it. And they, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, how do you go about truly evaluating whether this money well spent or not in um, advance of getting a report back. Well, it's I all mean, if come. The what? The if come. I mean, it, it, you know, you don't, you can't predict, right? Yeah. Well, that's true. Well, all, one, I try to work with experts we work with before. If it's an expert we never worked with before, we don't know what their end product's going to be like, and you know, you, just, you sort of keep a closer eye to that one. But I required more than just an intake form, or the intake forms is really just to sort of get somebody looking at it. I would require, before I approved money, I really would sort of grill the lawyer on what they'd done. I wanted to see the discovery, so that they looked at the discovery, they knew what was going on, they get into this theory of the case, how it fit into their theory of the case. Uh, you know, so at the end of the, the discussion, it didn't much matter, they were going to be going consent anyway, then why are we wasting the money doing it? Uh, you know, or the fingerprint is not going to be that crippling. Uh, you know, maybe you only need five hours to just confirm with the fingerprint expert, you know, that you have all the right paperwork and everything looks right. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes you have to do a little bit of that sort of CYA just to make sure that they, they requested an expert and you've got to, you know, try to respond to them because they saw a need for it. But I think you could, you could get from the lawyers uh, an assessment of the need and how much work they put into it. And be very firm with them, like, you have 10 hours, you know, we've got all these other lawyers who all want experts, you can't, you know, uh, you know, be wasting money, this is what we're going to need. Um, and, you know, we were pretty heavy-handed probably about how our experts on reports and stuff like that, and, you know, making sure they were giving us what we wanted as the end product. Uh, you know, if they burned us on that, then they weren't going to get hired again. Um, so, you know, we tried to take some big some control over that. All right, well, some of those folks who don't have a sort of an organized system, can you maybe share with the group what you've learned from these sort of suggestions on how it might be possible in your office to do these things? Um, I, I don't know, has somebody been sitting here or even over the last you know, day about how they can do this and make it cost effectively on? Well, Missouri has a statewide public defender system, and we probably have 350 lawyers. Probably 300 of them are trial lawyers, uh, and the rest are appellate or, or capital. Uh, but we're spread over 35 offices, offices as big as 36 lawyers, and offices as small as uh, two. Uh, so some offices, depending on the tenure, the experience, have some people who've done these things. I don't know that we really have people that I would call really have much expertise. And there really is not any sort of statewide system. 
uh, and I think we're missing an opportunity. We have a statewide training director. Uh, but we just don't. came on. She just came on. Laura Sullivan replaced yeah. Jeff Kellum. Right. Uh, so as I listened, I mean, it, it's sort of like I would like to take the Chicago model and somehow apply it to a giant state with 35 offices, and it kind of gets uh, hard hard to do that. You know what I think does that? Is there anyone in here from Minnesota? I think they do something like that. They have a statewide system, mm -hmm. they do. And, and I believe that they have, uh, Christine mm -hmm. Funk is here, she's from right. Minnesota, and I believe that they have kind of a roving group of mm -hmm. forensic science attorneys who ride the circuit and, and consult. I think that's how it works. That is how it works. Yeah, they do. They they do. They've had a little bit of problem with retention because people don't like having. You know, it's hard to have a family and be running all over the state of Minnesota. Um, in Missouri, interestingly enough, a budget oddity, I suppose. Uh, we have a, a pot that's never been exhausted yet uh, for experts, uh, but I'm not sure we're really spending it that wisely. If every time, if everybody out there is sort of reinventing the wheel every time, you wind up with inappropriate experts, uh, you know, medical examiners, and, you know, some of it's different because it's a pretty big state. And somebody who's willing to be an expert in St. Louis may not be willing to be an expert in Kansas City. Uh, but I, I think some sort of uh, system, but, you know, the problem is, where we're really, we have money, but we don't have attorney. We can't hire attorneys with the money. So it would be, the system would not be willing to take attorneys out of service, so to speak, right, yeah. to right. to be resource attorneys for other people. Uh, in fact, they've gone exactly the opposite way. For example, we had half a dozen alternative sentencing specialists who were social workers who were very productive in keeping people out of prison who might otherwise... And they just said, well, we can't afford them. We're firing all of them and hiring three attorneys to replace them or something like that. Uh, so we're really attorney poor and it's, it's a challenge. But I think there's got to be uh, a better way to do it, to formalize it, to make people resource people statewide uh, so that, you know, you can get DNA in birth wounds now. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, cheaper, faster, uh, property crimes is the wave of the future. I mean, you know, Denver DA's office really was the first big pilot project by DOJ to do that. But they closed a significant number of property crimes by showing that it, that it ended up being cost effective just because the cost and, and work had gone down. And, you know, the, but, the crazy thing is, uh, and, and I assume this is everywhere, but it certainly is in Kansas City, the federal government provides tremendous resources for processing these cold cases with forensic evidence. And, and then they provide them money to hire prosecutors. Of course, they don't provide any money to defend these cases. Right. And, uh, so you just get clobbered by these waves of cold DNA cases. Yeah. Now, uh, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy the feds are helping put this on, but they should think about the imbalance of resources in other ways other than training. Right. I've got at least four cold DNA. The what? I've got at least, I was just telling them, I've got, like, I've got four right now cold DNA rates that are five years old or older. Right. Yeah, it, you know, it's funny. I mean, you would a little bit of <laughs> BJA. Um, let me think how, how to say this. Um, well, I, when, when I started talking, I just I recognized Leon because my partner, Steve Jacobson, was talking to Leon trying to use technology by Skyping to talk about a case, send the materials to us in Colorado, looking at the case, uh, and then go through a training, through a PowerPoint, or be able to talk face-to-face -face because of Skype. That's just something that I think is new. It's new for us all technology-wise to make the world a little smaller, that we're able to do that. So in Missouri, if you could get up to where, speed, where some lawyers have that kind of statewide uh, you know, knowledge, you'll be able to have those kinds of interfaces with each other about it. Um, or, and, you know, I'll talk to Leon after about how it's working with, because uh, I, I wasn't able to sort of participate in that call the other day, how it's working for us to do that. Because that's really, when I left PDS, you know, 
I guess I probably had a good dose of Catholic guilt still in me uh, to, to feel bad that the feds had put all this money into me and trained me all these years. Uh, you know, that I'm going out to, to Colorado to, you know, we had a, a new baby and D.C. didn't seem like the, the place we wanted to be anymore. Uh, and, but, you know, I recognized that I had a lot of resources in there. So we started consulting on cases to try to make people, uh, to give people the opportunity to have a this division or even the PDS model of FPG and not worry about attrition by saying, you could call us up, you could have all the institutional knowledge we have. We have the software, the DNA software. I know Cook County has it too. But, you know, that's 30000 bucks a pop. Uh, to get the DNA uh, software in order to analyze the electronic data in the case. So we have that. And so, you know, we've been consulting on cases in Virginia and Kentucky and, uh, you know, California, helping people uh, understand their DNA evidence and then also put forward a bunch of ch different challenges. I, I worked on that Kentucky arson uh, tool mark case that uh, Marvin Schechter mentioned earlier today, Smallwood. Um, so, you know, we've been able to, to be able to help be a resource for people who don't have the luxury in these kinds of offices. Um, and we do it at, you know, a ridiculously, you know, we figure out a sort of a rate that is having, having been the approver that I would approve, <laughs> um, being the stingiest approver that the office had ever had. So, you know, I mean, I think there's creative ways that we can talk about how we do it. You know, we find experts out there who are willing to talk to us, and maybe it is setting up Skype so we, there's more intimacy in the conversation about cases. Um, or, you know, I, that's why I'm interested in sort of, you know, Bloomington, Illinois, talking to Cook County and getting, you know, maybe not through the CL, CLE system, but even the PD offices uh, working together, talking, supporting each other. Uh, and doing this work together. Um, any other sort of thoughts on resources and, and how you get it? Because there's lots of expertise out there. Once you've worked a couple of these cases, you do have a special knowledge on it. You really have an obligation, I think, somewhat to share it or to be there as a resource. And as a community, I think we do do that. Uh, we figure out how, how, uh, how to get that accomplished. Um, you know, part of, so we, you know, we're here to talk about how to supervise and support attorneys with forensic science cases. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the kinds of supervision that happened in some of these offices, maybe, you know, where it's lacking in others. Uh, does anybody else have any other thing they would want to share with the group or discuss as the group about how we better supervise these cases, either from intake to issue spot um, to train? I mean, we've sort of talked about all the sort of structures from small, medium to large to going outside and maybe trying to sort of creatively think of our own ways to create a, I have a, question create to ask. a resource. Uh, list serves. Um, do people here have list serves where they can get to other people who deal with these kinds of things? And if you are on a list serve, does the prosecutor have access to that list serve? So they can't get on the list serve, right? What about, is there anybody who has thought of having a blog, a forensic blog, where you actually can communicate that way? Is there, is there anything out there like that? I don't think there's any blog. There is uh, a listserv. Um, it, uh, I think it was started by Bill Thompson out in California. Mm -hmm. It's on DNA. It's a DNA listserv. And it's very, very informative, but right. it is also not password protected, so it's open the public right so there's always a uh, uh, attention with, with blogging and, and list serving about um, as a defense community how much of your stuff you want to put out there right that's why in terms of DNA uh, Bill Thompson is, is at University of California right. um, Irvine, Irvine. Um, if you online William Thompson you'll find him he's done a lot of work in the DNA area and, and um, I think the way I got on the list service I just emailed him you just get on and there are a lot of it's like people. a Yahoo group. Yeah, it's a Yahoo group. Yahoo group. There's a lot of people who've done a lot of litigation who are talking to each other about the, the latest stuff. It's good. They do that with eyewitness also, because I'm on the listserv for eyewitness cases, and that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, the DNA one does go off topic, so some people will shoot you know, emails out on fingerprints and some others, but it, it does tend to be the group that's on that one is pretty good. 
Then Adina Schwartz uh, at uh, John Jay on tool marks. She's sort of the firearm tool mark spur in the saddle of the APTI group. Uh, she runs, uh, you know, she sends out blast emails to a very long list of lawyers, uh, heads of offices around the country, sort of keeping them up to date on tool mark cases. What's um, Adina Schwartz at John Jay in New York. So you can just ask her to add you to her huge uh, email list, or, uh, your email list, and you know she'll send the pleadings, the newest cases that are out. Uh, you know she generally has been sort of capturing a lot of the NAS, you know, favorable NAS uh, decisions, and sending a copy of those. Uh, it is important to sort of keep up with the, there are blogs obviously on the appellate, in the appellate world, and there are some, you know, important cases that do come down. So when Bull Cumming came down a couple weeks ago, there was lots of traffic about that, and the importance of that decision on this confrontation issue with regard to forensic analysts. So it is important to keep abreast on that. It's nice to have somebody maybe who's, on, who's focused on those issues to help pick out of appellate cases and appellate blogs. Uh, or listservs, what is important to, to forensic science, because there are cases that come down that, that is, it, it are important to look at. Uh, and the Bull Cumming case is B-U-L-L-C-U-M-I-N-G uh, versus New Mexico. What other places go look for training um, that's not lawyer training, but, but forensic scientist training is uh, American Academy of Forensic Science every February. As our annual conference, it's a week long. It's on some rotating city. Um, it's a little pricey, but our office, especially when we were just getting started, we went every year. They sent our group there, and it's all the people from your state lab, your forensic lab, and labs, law enforcement labs around the com uh, country, getting together and talking about the latest, greatest stuff. And you can sit there and listen to it too. Uh, what, uh, Rob, when Robert was talking about how they do trainings, it, it, it reminded me that one thing that we would be uh, that we would try to do at PDS to capitalize on the fact that we were paying for an expert was when an expert came to testify in a case. The day that we were paying for them to be there to testify in the case, we would make them come into the office and do a training for the rest of the lawyers in the office <laughs> on what their role was in the case. That's and true. so we'd make it turn into a brown bag, like uh, and you know we'd sell it to them, be like, you can promote like your services That's through true. this, and talk to everybody about blood spatter. Uh -huh. um, and it would great, you know, everybody would come because they wanted to all hear about how this expert was being used and, and what purpose, and look at their presentation and also get to interact with the lawyer and identify the lawyer in the office who had that case so that they go to them next time. Uh, you know, or they get to hear uh, what the, uh, the cross was. So it was like double dipping on the hourly rate that they were charging uh, by doing it. So, you know, when you're in charge of the money, like, you start thinking about all kinds of clever ways to, uh, to, to maximize on it. Um, so resources, Li uh, you know, listservs, uh, these, NACDL resources and NLADA, there's been a historically a problem of keeping them really up to date. PDS had really constructed with the assistance of Bill Thompson at UC Irvine and built it up. Then it would go without, you know, much being put into it. So I'm not entirely, I can't vouch for how current it is right now. Uh, but I do know that I was contacted within the last year by the Houston Institute at Harvard that they were had a big pot of money to spend on creating this new system and platform uh, that would be password protected so that criminal defense lawyers could have uh, resources. And uh, I called the other day just to find out what the status is. They are having an attrition issue. So the person who was there last year, Rob Smith, is gone. Now it's a, a woman, last name is O'Neill. Uh, first name, it's very Irish, I can't remember what it is. It starts with a G. Um, and she's the one now, I think, in charge of that. And I wasn't able to connect up with her to see what the status is, but uh, you know, it sounded to me like there were some very smart people uh, you know, digging down, wanting to reconstruct what NLADA did in the forensic library and make it current and had a pot of money to keep, keep it going. And that would be password protected. And so that's, that sounded to me like a really good option out there for resources. Um, other resources, I mean, it really is important to go and keep your eyes out for the CLEs in your area. There, there will be uh, times that, that, that they'll do that. 
you know, I had pretty good success of trying to get the MEs, like it sounds like in Cook County, the MEs are interested in sort of, you know, showing their stuff and they'll come and do a training for you for your in office. Um, they like it because it goes on their resume. Uh, you know, I always found, you know, that experts on the prosecution side wanted to talk so that they could claim that, you know, they're open to everybody, they're objective, you know, we're, our door's always open, why don't you come on in and talk to us? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've been called by the defense, one out of, you know, 3,000 times I've been called, but I'm always open. Uh, you know, they are, they'll come into a training in your office so they can put it on their resume to try to get a little bit of balance. So there are ways to, to stretch dollars and there's ways to really get up to speed. I, you know, I can't say enough about using the NAS report in Chapter 5 of really getting a good basis, a uh, basic understanding of the disciplines, of many of the disciplines, uh, and their shortcomings by going to that and, and just build off of that. Uh, you know, start building a library. Uh, PDS had a, in the special counsel's office, you know, a bookshelf that just was all the forensic books that we'd sort of collected over the years. You know, so we have, you know, Werner Spitz's, you know, uh, Medicological Investigations of Death, you know, all the way through DeMaio's, and so we had all, you know, the pathology books, and we had, uh, you know, the different DNA books and resources, so you know, we, we at one time had a big library, but we still had the forensic library there so they could interact with the special counsel if they had sp particular questions. And we did it by also being a resource for the appellate division as well. Uh, and quite honestly, the appellate folks actually were getting up to speed on these things too. These were some of the important appellate issues and cases, and so you get you need to, you know, go to them. They're the people who have the transcripts and the trans transcript data, you know, uh, if you're going to compile transcripts, don't leave out your appellate divisions. Uh, they could be very good at spotting which ones need to be flagged to, to build up your, your transcript uh, resource base. Uh, any other? You know, we have about 60 more seconds. Anybody else want to uh, sort of throw out ideas? Or anybody feeling this is, sounds good, you're jealous of how other offices are <laughs> set up, uh, you're bullish on how you're going to be able to, to go in and transform your offices. Any, any thoughts? Well, I hope this is helpful. I, I, I hope it's helpful to look at the structure of other offices, uh, to think about, you know, there's, even though each one's different, they're all the same kind of in certain ways too. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of offices start ad hoc and then it becomes more institutionalized. Uh, you're able to sort of maybe have a line for somebody devoted to it. But, uh, you know, I think we all sort of are getting there in the same way, which is to just point out that it's very important to have a person at least and usually a group of people who are really energized, passionate, interested to look at these issues, share the knowledge, be a resource to come to. Uh, and then, and then you go from there. So, and you know, I'm always happy to talk to lawyers about things uh, in your cases. So definitely reach out to me. We could talk about institutional things, and we could talk about you know uh, how we do it uh, on the on the issue of how we're doing it. You know, we I've been consulting with New Orleans Public Defender's Office and dealing with their cases, uh, dealing with you know different state systems that didn't have a system in place. We're trying to sort of create one. For them so that they have a point person to go to. So there are just, just a, a number or myriad ways of doing it and I think that uh, the encouraging thing is now with something like the NAS report we have a little more ammunition. We weren't spinning our wheels and getting as jaded as I think we were, you know, I mean I was getting jaded, uh, you know, after 10 years of fighting this battle and I still fight with the same jaded judges, thankfully they're all clearing out uh, of DC after I left. But, um, you know, I, I think there's lots of energy on this issue, and I think there's lots to do. So, uh, good luck, and I hope to you know get to talk to you all through the rest of the next day. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.